two announcements. One, your homework seven is due tomorrow midnight. The other one is that we have a mid-semester survey that went out yesterday. Um, we want to get your feedback on how the class is going. It's a very short, targeted survey on a couple of aspects of the class. But then there's also a question at the end that says, in a longer survey that we might do later, tell us whichever other questions you want us to ask. But the current survey is pretty short, nine questions, many of them multiple choice. Should take you probably a minute or two, not much longer than that, to give your feedback so we know how some of these things are going. We really appreciate it if you would take the time to do that. Okay, lecture for today. is going to be about decision networks and value of perfect information. And let's right away start with a demo here. Um, Remember Ghostbusters? So the game here was that there is a ghost somewhere in this grid. We don't know where the ghost is. And our goal playing this game is to discover where the ghost is and bust it. So we, we can't actually see where the ghost is, but we can get sensory measurements. For example, I measured in this square. I got an orange reading. And that means the ghost is medium close, most likely. There's stochastic readings. We don't know for sure where the ghost is, even when we get a red reading. But to give us some sense of where the ghost might be. Yellow is likely further away. Red is the more intense reading that we can get. And after we do a bunch of readings here, likely the ghost is in one of the two red squares. Not for sure, because these are stochastic readings. Sensors are noisy. But if we were to choose where to bust, most likely we'd pick, it'd be one of those red squares that we want to pick. Maybe we sense some more and we say, well, it's orange here, which is closer to this one, so maybe let's bust over here and hope that works out. And we got it. But this is very ad hoc. We kind of just look at the colors and then do some inference in our heads about where it's likely that the ghost might be. Um, then we saw if we run Bayesian inference, we can actually compute the probabilities of where the ghost might be. So we now use a formal model. We have a prior where a priori the ghost is equally likely to be in any of these squares. So 2% chance for each of the 50 squares. We have a sensory model. If the ghost is one square, grid square away, there is some probability of measuring red, some probability of measuring orange, some probability of measuring yellow, some probability of measuring green. And that conditional probability table is different depending on the distance to the ghost. And so because the sensor acts differently depending on the distance to the ghost, we can do Bayesian inference and infer something about where the ghost might be by using this sensor. So right now, where we would start, not a whole lot of information yet. Let's say we measure here. We run Bayesian inference and get a update, updated distribution over where the ghost might be given this one sensory measurement. And note that distribution has been updated for all possible grid squares here, not just right where we measured. And this can inform us about where we might want to measure next. Let's say maybe we measure here next. That was a seemingly a good choice. Um, we cannot measure in the same square, but we can measure around it and see if that might increase the probability of the one we think the ghost might be at. Probability is pretty high up to rounding errors. It's probability one. So maybe it's time to take our bust action. And we got the ghost. So being able to do probabilistic inference helps us to understand what currently the distribution is for where the ghost might be and when we have enough information to maybe decide to bust. But it's still pretty ad hoc in many ways. Let's say the game is now defined as follows. Every time you sense, you pay a penalty of one. So your score goes down by one every time you use your sensing action. If you bust successfully, then you get a plus 250. So huge reward, but you can bust only once. If you bust unsuccessfully, you get a reward of zero, and game is over too. So now you could ask yourself the question, what's the right thing to do? Let's say we were to play this game again, and we have in mind this particular reward scheme, minus one for sensing, plus 250 for 
busting correctly, zero for busting incorrectly, but whenever we bust, game is over. What should we do? Well, intuitively, probably we should do some sensing here because probability of success is pretty low. Cost of sensing is just one relative to a reward of busting, 250. So probably we should sense. Um, at this point, what should we do? Probably we still want to sense, but we actually, in principle, we should compute something. There is some computation that in principle we could do that we're going to cover today that will tell us how good it is to sense versus how good it is to bust, and then we can make an informed decision about what is going to maximize our expected utility. So here we might say, let's do more sensing. Then the question would be where? Which sensing spot would be the most valuable? We're paying a price of one here to sense. Which is the most interesting one? It's hard to say, right? You'd have to somehow do a computation and say, well, if I were to sense somewhere, there's a distribution over possible readings, and then depending on what I get to see, there will be an update to the distribution of where the ghost might be, and which of these updates will be most informative, right? Um, you could argue sensing nearby is clever, but you might, be th might think that our, uh, maybe sensing a little further away is more clever because nearby we already know a lot and it's not as informative to sense nearby. Right now we don't know that. We can just use some intuition and say, well, maybe sensing over here is a good idea and informative, but maybe sensing over here is more informative, hard to say. We're going to try to formalize that idea of how you deal with the fact if your sensory measurements would cost you might cost you time, might cost you reward. And at the same time, they give you information about something that can give you maybe a bigger reward at the end. How do you deal with that setting? That's the topic of today's lecture. The concept we're going to use to reason about this is called decision networks. And decision networks are a lot like Bayesian networks. So here's an example of a decision network. We have a few different variables here. We have this part here is just a base net. We have two random variables, weather, could be sunny or rainy. And there's a, potential, there's a forecast random variable. The forecast could tell us rainy or sunny. It's a random variable, which we can observe by maybe listening to a forecast on the radio. So this part is just a base net. Then this part over here, this variable umbrella, is an action variable. It's shown in a rectangular um, square. This indicates action variables. So any rectangular square will be action variables. We can choose, or our 188 robot can choose whether or not to bring an umbrella. And then there is utility associated with the value of the parents of the utility node. So this here is a utility function which depends on the umbrella action and on the weather random variable. And depending on those two variables, your utility can be higher or lower and will take on some numerical value. And we'll look at numbers later. We can imagine sunny and not bringing an umbrella is the ideal outcome, whereas rainy and not bringing an umbrella is the worst outcome. Okay. So what we're interested in now is maximizing our expected utility. So choose the action that maximizes the expected utility given the evidence we observed so far. Um, we have BaseNet nodes. Um, the BaseNet nodes allow us to do the probability computations. And then we have the new nodes, namely action nodes and utility nodes. And let's look at an example here. So here's how this is going to work. You have some evidence. You instantiate all the evidence in your base net. Once you instantiated all the evidence in your base net, you run probabilistic inference. And the query you're computing for is this one here. You compute the posterior for the parent nodes of the utility node U, given the evidence. Then you set action nodes to all their possible values. So you have a branching here. You're going to do a computation for each possible action value. And you calculate for each possible action value the expected utility you would get under that action. And then you choose the action that maximizes 
this expected utility. So let's work through this. Here's our simplified example, round, one random variable, weather, unobserved, one action variable, umbrella, and a utility node U. We have a distribution, 70% chance that it's sunny, 30% chance rainy. And here's our utility table. Utility of 100 for leaving the umbrella at home and it being sunny. Utility of zero if you leave your umbrella at home and it's rainy. Utility of 20 if you take the umbrella and it's sunny. And utility of 70 when you take the umbrella and it's rainy. That's our problem definition. This is what we start from. What we're trying to answer now is the question, what's the optimal action to take? The action that will optimize our expected utility. Is it taking the umbrella or is it leaving it at home? Okay, what happens if we leave the umbrella at home? Okay, um, if we leave it at home with probability for sun times, sorry, our expected utility for leave is equal to the sum over all possible weather outcomes, W, the probability of that weather outcome times the utility of that weather outcome and leaving the umbrella at home. In this case, that means it's a probability of sun times the utility of sun and leave plus the probability of rain times the utility of rain, comma, leave. We can fill in the values, 0.7 times 100 plus 0.3 times rain and leave is zero. So overall, we end up with a expected utility of 70. We can now do the same thing for umbrella equals take. The expected utility for the action taking the umbrella is, again, the sum over all possible weather outcomes. In general, the summation here will be over all possible outcomes of the parent variables of the utility node. In this case, there's just one parent variable weather. Um, probability of the outcome W times the utility of W and take. In this case, that is the probability of sun times the utility of sun and take, plus the probability of rain, times the utility for rain and take. This is 0 0.7 times utility for sun and take is 20, plus 0 0.3 times utility for rain and take is 70. So our expected utility here is, let's see, 14 plus... 21, which is 35. We've looked at both possible actions. For each of them, we, each of the possible actions, we computed the expected utility. 70 for leave, 35 for take, 70 is higher. So the optimal action in terms of maximizing our expected utility is to leave the umbrella at home. And so we have the maximum expected utility MEU for this particular problem is equal to 70. I'm going to put a phi in here. This is the empty set. What I'm explicitly denoting here is the maximum expected utility if we have observed nothing. We have seen no variables observed is 70. If we were to observe variables, things can change. But for now, we observe no variables. Maximum expected utility in this problem with no observed variables is 70. Okay, so this will probably remind you of something we did in the fifth or sixth lecture in this semester, and that looked like this, Expectimax. Right. What's going on here? You have a root node, you choose between actions, take or leave. Then there's a chance node. The weather is our random variable. It's not 
some other player is just some random variable. Whether it can take on the value sun or rain. We have a distribution for that. Sun was 0 0.7, rain was 0 0.3. And then the same thing in the other branch. Um, weather could be sun or rain. And then we have utility nodes at the bottom layer of our expected max tree. What we just did on the previous slide when we worked through this computation here was solving this expected max tree. We computed this value, this value by looking them up in a table, summed them together in a weighted fashion to get this utility. We did the same computation, similar computation over here. We compared the two values, picked the highest one and said, well, that's our optimal action and the expected utility associated with that is our maximum expected utility. So what has changed or what is, what is going to change really in what we're doing now is we're going to explicitly keep track of the information available to the agent making decisions. So for now, no information is available. So the empty set is being kept track of here as we work through this expected max tree. But by keeping track of the information we have available, you can now imagine that in the future we could insert additional evidence, have a new tree that has additional evidence explicitly accounted for. You could even have actions that are collect this evidence, go measure this variable, and explicitly model that in an expected max tree. So that's where we're headed. Okay, so let's see what happens with evidence. We now have a two random variable base net here, and together this forms a decision network. When we start with this decision network, what we have is a prior distribution for weather, and we have a conditional distribution for forecast given weather. We observe forecast equals bad. Now, after observing that, we run inference. We run inference and find the posterior distribution for weather given the forecast was bad. This is something you'll have to do. You'll have to compute that because it's not given in the specification of the Bayes net what that posterior is going to be, but you can compute it with, in this case, just applying Bayes rule. In general, you run variable elimination if it's computationally feasible. If it's too big a Bayes net, you might run a sampling method to get an approximate estimate of the posterior for weather given, in this case, forecast equals bad. In general, you compute the posterior or approximate posterior of the parent variables of your utility node given all the evidence variables. This was done for us on the slide here. We have the posterior given to us. Um, we end up with 34% chance of sun, 66% chance of rain if the forecast was bad. We can now go through the same computation. What is the expected utility if we leave the umbrella at home? Expected utility for leave with our evidence set being forecast equals bad is the sum over all parent variables of the utility node, which in this case is the weather variable, the probability for taking on the value W given our evidence, the forecast was bad, times the utility for leaving and this particular weather W. Working this out, we have the probability for sun given bad forecast, which is, well, sun given forecast is bad times utility for leave and sun plus the probability for rain given the forecast is bad times utility for rain and leave. Filling numbers into this, we have 0 0.34 times leave and sun, which is 100, plus 0 0.66 times utility for rain and leave is zero. So we end up with an expected utility value of leaving, for leaving the umbrella at home of 34 when we have the evidence that the forecast was bad. We can do something similar for umbrella equals stick. Expected utility for taking the umbrella, given the evidence set that the forecast equals bad, is the sum over all possible instantiation of the parent variables of the utility node, in this case, the weather variable, the probability of that instantiation given the evidence times 
the utility of this action take and that particular weather instantiation. So we end up with zero, well, probability of sun given forecast equal bad times utility for take and sun plus the utility plus the probability for rain given forecast equals bad times the utility for rain and take which is equal to 0 0.34 times take and sun is 20 plus 0 0.66 times rain and take which is 70. Um, not going to do that out of the top of my head, but you compute this, you get the expected utility for taking the umbrella if the evidence is forecast was bad. Okay, let's take a look at what that number comes out as. We have 34 for the first one and 53 for the second one. So now that we have observed the evidence of the forecast being bad, the maximum expected utility is 53. And the action achieving it is to take the umbrella. So after observing this evidence, we see that our optimal action changed and our expe maximum expected utility changed. So take would be the optimal action and maximum expected utility with this evidence over here, that's our notation, we put in parentheses the evidence that we observe, is the max over all expected utilities for then taking a particular action and conditioning on a particular evidence set, we computed, there's two of those because there's two actions. This is the 34 and the 53. The max of those is 53. Okay, so what does it look like now in an expected max tree? What we just did looks as follows. So what's different from the previous tree? The difference is right here. As we draw the tree, we have conditioning on a particular evidence set, and accordingly, there is a difference in the transition probabilities in the tree. So we used to have probability for sun 0 0.7, but now this is the probability of sun given forecast equals bad, which is 0.34. Same thing here, the probability here is the probability for rain given the forecast was bad, which is 0 0.66, which is different from the original 0 0.3. So what has changed is the probabilities of transitioning here and we explicitly denote what evidence is available as we work through this decision tree or this um, expected max tree. Okay, let's think back to Ghostbusters. So Ghostbusters, what would the decision network look like for that particular case? Let's see if we can come up with something here. So what do we have? We had a utility for Taking the action bust, we would get it. Let's, let's for now ignore the sensing actions. Let's just think of the busting action. So we could bust um, in some, some, um, some location. So our choice is to bust in a particular location. We have 50 grid squares. We have 50 possible choices here. Whichever one we pick will affect our utility. If we bust at the right spot, we get 250. We bust at the wrong spot, we get zero. Then there's the ghost location. This is a random variable. And it's a parent of the utility node. So those are the two parents of the utility node. Our action, where we're going to bust, and then the ghost location. There's more to it. We are able to sense, so there are random variables that relate to the ghost location and the way it worked is that we can go sense at any particular location, and then we get some sensory reading there. So those sensory readings are random variables. And so we have a sensor at one, one. We have a sensor at one, two. We have a sensor at one, three. And these are all, and th this keeps going all the way till at the end here, sensor at, um, let's see, 10 by 5, so 10 comma 5, let's say. So these are all child variables of the random variable ghost location. And 
if we have any evidence, we can run inference in this pretty big base net over here to get a posterior over the ghost location, which can take on 50 values. The sensory nodes can take on red, orange, yellow, green, four values. Ghost location take on 50 values. You can inference, run inference in this base net based on whatever sensory observations you have so far. At that point, you have a posterior over ghost locations. And at that point, you could compute, let's say, if you were required to bust at some location, you could say, well, what is my best place to bust at? What is the expected utility for each bust action? And then you could pick that maximizing action. Maybe you pick, in, you pick the right spot, maybe not. But you know ahead of time what your expected utility is going to be. Um, now what we want to do is augment what we've been looking at so far to include actions that involve sensory measurements. So really, you want to also reason about, is it worth to sense one more time? Should I sense one more time and then maybe only bust at the next time? The concept we need for that, and we're, we already saw this demo here, um, the concept we need for that is value of information. So how much are you willing to pay to get a sensing action? In the game we set forward, it was defined as a cost of one so a reward of minus one to cents. And so then the question wouldn't be how much are you willing to pay? The question would be, are you willing to pay that cost of one or are you not willing to pay the cost of one? So what is value of information? Let's start with a simpler example than the Ghostbusters example. So we want to compute the value of acquiring some evidence. Let's think of a monetary example here, buying oil drilling rights. So you're a consultant, let's say, for an oil company, and you're thinking of buying some drilling rights somewhere, and you're going to tell them how much that's worth for them, how much should they be paying for, for those drilling rights. Um, maybe they should go do some more measurements before they buy something. So here's our, utility, uh, our decision diagram. We have a utility node here related to whether you drilled in the right oil loca location for oil. Random variable where the oil ends up being. And the action is which location you drill at. So it's going to be a very simple example. There are two blocks, A and B. Exactly one of them has oil in it worth K. Let's say in, utility met, in a utility metric, utility of K. You can drill in one location. So your action is choosing either A or B. So your action will be A or B. But then here also the oil location will be a or B. The prior probabilities are 0 0.5 for each location. And they're mutually exclusive. It's not possible that you can have oil in both locations. So here's what it looks like. Um, utility of K, if we drill in the right spot, 0 if we drill in the wrong spot. So the expected utility of just going out and drilling is k over 2, because half the time you'll succeed, half the time you'll fail. Maximum expected utility is k over 2. You can ask yourself the question, what's the value of information of O? If you got to observe the random variable O, if that were an option, how much would you be willing to pay to get that observation? Well, if you observe that random variable O at that point, you know where the oil is. You'll be able to take the action to drill right where the oil is. And your expected utility, once you have observed O, will be K. So observing O leads to an expected utility that's K, whereas initially you had K over 2. So that's K over 2 better. So to you, the value of observing O is K over 2, the difference between your expected utility before, before observing it and after observing it. So the gain is K over 2. And fair price of that information, we can now put a price on information, in this case is k over 2. This is a simple scenario, but hopefully it gets the intuition across that you can put a price on information this way. With this formalism, any piece of information, any variable you observe, you could put a number on what's the expected utility before I observed that variable, what's the expected utility after observing that variable, and the difference is the value of, of information for that variable. OK, so let's look at an example here. Our running example for weather and forecast. Same utility node, same base net. What's the maximum expected utility with no evidence? We computed that at the very beginning. If there's no evidence, 
The distribution over weather is just its prior distribution. The best action was to leave the umbrella at home and the expected utility was 70. What if there is evidence? Well, we don't know what the evidence is going to be. If you're getting evidence, it could be either a bad or a good forecast. So we have two scenarios here. What if the evidence is a bad forecast? We computed the expected maximum expected utility for that. It was 53. We can do a similar computation as we did for a bad forecast for when the forecast is good. We're not going to work through this. It's the exact same uh, procedure as we did for the bad forecast. If you work through that, you'll see that the maximum expected utility then is 95, and the optimal action is to um, leave the umbrella at home. OK, so now what is the value of information of getting that forecast? It's going to be the difference between what we had here, the expected utility without that information. But then now, unlike with the old oil drilling example, there are two numbers here. It might be a good forecast, it might be a bad forecast. So the way we compute the value of information is by differencing these two, but we have to weight the second set of outcomes here about how likely these outcomes are. So we would say, well, if we get to, in this case, observe forecast, we have a probability for forecast. So what's, the val what's our value of information, of perfect information? for getting to observe the random variable forecast, or written shorter, the VPI for forecast. It's the value we'll have, the expected, maximum expected utility, in case we get to observe the forecast, which is um, maximum expected utility when the forecast is given, minus the maximum expected utility when we have no evidence. This one here we know is equal to 70. This one here is equal to the probability that the forecast is good times the maximum expected utility for forecast equal good plus the probability that the forecast equals bad times the maximum expected utility in case the forecast is bad. Okay, so we wait by the probability of each measurement. What is the probability for the forecast to be good? Well, this is a base net. In this base net, we're given the probability for weather. We're given the probability for forecast given weather. From that, we can compute the, we can solve for the probability for forecast. It will take a little bit of work, but we know how to do that. Once we compute that, we can compute this quantity over here. We would get the, we would know then the probability for forecast being good, probability for forecast being bad. We already know the ex maximum expected utility for forecast equal good, which is here. We know the maximum expected utility for forecast equals bad, which is over here. And then we can take the difference, and that difference tells us the value of information in observing the forecast. So let's take a look at what happens if we insert the numbers. So. The forecast distribution after running inference in the base net is 59% probability for a good forecast, 41% for a bad forecast. Then we can fill in the numbers. And what we end up with is that we have a value of perfect information for the random variable forecast of 7.8. In general, this equation looks like this. And this is a lot of symbols, so let's take some time to look at what's going on here. Um, value of perfect information for getting to observe a random variable E prime after we already might have had some evidence E. In the example we had here, there was no evidence yet. So in the example we looked at, this small E would be the empty set. But in general, it's possible you already had some evidence. And so then you can, you can compute the value of perfect information for getting to, getting to observe a new random variable, E prime, given the evidence you've seen so far. 
It's the difference between, and let's look at this term first. This is the maximum expected utility for the current evidence set. We know how to compute that. That is just for the current evidence, run inference in your base net, find the distribution over parent variables given the evidence, and then compute for each possible action the expected utility, check which action maximizes that, and that's your maximum expected utility. So that's given the current evidence. And we're going to compare that with what if we do get to observe that random variable. It's a random variable, so we need to sum over all possible instantiations E prime it can take on. And we'll weight the sum, the terms in the sum by the probability of that particular instantiation E prime of the variable we're about to measure. And then multiply that with the maximum expected utility once we have evidence both E and E prime. Note that here the probability is the probability for E prime given the evidence we've seen so far. That's the same thing we computed here. Distribution for F, given the evidence we had so far. In our example, there was no evidence, so it's just the distribution for F given no evidence. OK, let's, let's go back and put this into some uh, expected max trees. So what are the different cases we've looked at? Maximum expected utility for some evidence, which was you computed the posterior for the parent variables of the utility node, S. Once you have that posterior, you can compute for every action A, the expected utility of that action. And then you check what these expected utilities are, pick the best action, that defines your maximum expected utility. If we see um, some new evidence, E prime, let's assume we've seen it, we can do the same thing. And this is really the same equation as we had above, it's just now, everywhere where we had E, we have E and E prime. But if we're starting to reason about what if we get to observe an extra variable, we don't know yet what the value is going to be. So in general, um, we need to consider all possible outcomes. And so we need to compute an expected value rather than just a value for a very specific instantiation, E prime. The expected value is the sum over all possible instantiations for E prime, where you weight the terms by the probability of that outcome E prime given the evidence so far. And then this thing here is the same as this quantity over here. The value of information is the difference between the two quantities. So value of perfect information of E prime given E is the maximum expected utility for having E and the random variable E prime, which is the quantity over here, minus the maximum expected utility before we had any evidence, which is sitting over here. So this is a great question. Is it possible to end up with a negative value? Is it possible that you ask for information, right? Let's look at this here. So what you see here is a, a difference, right? And so is it possible that the quantity here on the left is smaller than the quantity you're going to subtract? And the answer is no, that's not possible. So it turns out that you can prove, and in any example you'll try out, you'll see that it is true, that this quantity here will always be larger than the quantity on the right. Intuitively, the reason that's true is that if you get information, if, you, if you're going to get more information, you're going to be able to do better. Um, and let's look at it in the expected max tree in a second. But the, the idea here is that you get to defer your decision. You could think of that information coming in anyway. And on the right-hand side here, you are making a decision based on some evidence. Now you can imagine the evidence comes in, but your decision has been made. And so the evidence comes in, and there's many possible evidences that could come in. But your decision has been made. And then after the evidence, you make your decision, evidence comes in, utility gets assigned. Whereas on the left here, you get to wait, observe the random instantiation of the evidence, the extra evidence, then make a decision that could depend now on the evidence you got to observe, and then the utilities only get assigned. And so because you get to defer your decision, you can adapt it to the evidence, and you'll get, on average, a higher utility. Now, what's really tricky here is that it's not necessarily the case that this one here is larger than this one here. So it's not 
guaranteed that MEU EE prime is bigger than or equal to MEU E. That's not guaranteed, but it is guaranteed that MEU E comma random variable E prime is being or equal to MEU for just the original evidence. Correct. Yes, so let's, let's break this down. Let's break down this one at the top here just to get some more intuition. So why is this not guaranteed? Well, let's say you look, we've seen an example of this actually. We can go back. Our running example here showed that our maximum expected utility with no evidence was 70. With the additional evidence of the forecast being bad was 53. So our maximum expected utility went down. We also saw that if our additional evidence happened to come out as forecast equals good, our maximum expected utility went up. And you can show that the way this will average out, while it can go up or down for any possible evidence, the way they will average out is that on the average, as we saw here, you end up with something that's higher. So let's take a look at what this looks like in our expected max trees, and it might give some more intuition about why this is working out the way it is. So the first tree we're looking at is the one where we have just our original evidence. Some original evidence plus E has been observed. Next, we have to take our action. We choose between two actions. After that, we can compute the expected utility. We compute the distribution for the parent variables of the utility node, given the evidence, and then can propagate up of those utilities. The second scenario, so this is one. Come on, Pen. The second case is one where we have additional evidence, E prime, from the beginning. So this is our second case over here. Um, Aside from the extra evidence, everything is the same. Third case, what's happening is we get some evidence plus E. Then after getting to observe that first evidence, there is another round of evidence that comes in, E prime, and we have a branching. We could see plus E prime or negative E prime. Only after we get to observe the additional evidence, we have to take our action A. And so intuitively the reason in this tree over here, the value of the root node is higher than in the top tree over here, is because you can defer your decision until the evidence E prime has been observed. In the top tree, whatever action you take is gonna be the same, no matter what happened to be the evidence E prime. In the bottom tree, you can tailor your action to that particular evidence. It is possible some evidence is particularly bad for you. A bad forecast is not what you were hoping for. So in that branch of the tree, things will go bad, but that branch will be weighted by how likely it is to get that bad forecast, and overall things will be better because you can adapt your actions to the particular forecast you're getting or the particular additional evidence you're getting in the more general case. It's not a proof, but just some intuition of how that works out, of why that works out. Okay, let's take a break here. And after the break, let's look at some properties of VPI and how to use them to make decisions. All right, let's restart. Um, with my pen back, let me clarify the difference again between this one here and this one here. And in doing so, clarify why the VPI or some random variable E prime, given some evidence, will always be positive. So this expected max tree over here, we can rewrite this equivalently, a tree that will give you the same set of results as follows. Um, plus E to start out with. 
Then from plus E, we go choose our action. We land in a chance node. From that chance node, we could observe plus E prime or negative E prime. Same on the other side, plus E prime, negative E prime. Then from this chance node, we have yet another chance node, um, which will tell us what the outcome will be over possible states. So we'll have, and once we observe, we get the state, we get the utility values. So this looks like this. So what do we have here? We have, first one is an action layer, A. Then we have a evidence layer, this one here. The distribution for E prime given E plus E is what's going to rule this chance node and this chance node. The next chance node layer there will be the distribution for S given plus E and plus E prime. This one there will be the probability for S given plus E negative E prime and so forth. In this more extensive version of this first tree over here, we made explicit the additional evidence variable. All right. Initially we had an action variable and then a distribution over states and then a utility. Um, we could just, just as well include the evidence variable E prime. We pick an action, after that, both the additional evidence variable and the state get randomly instantiated, and then we get some utility. That's really the same process. We're acting in the same type of world. Um, but now if we compare this tree at the top here with the tree at the bottom, what we see is that the fundamental difference is that our action node at the bottom is deferred till after we observe the evidence E prime, which means that our action can be tailored to the evidence E prime that we get to observe, whereas in this top tree over here, our action is already fixed, and the evidence E prime is not going to be able to affect anymore what our action is going to be. And so, what that comes down to, if you want to do, if you want to look at the difference between these two, the one at the top, oh man, between the one at the top and the bottom, is that the one at the top is the same as if in this layer over here, the action layer, you would have to fix your action. You could not choose your action independently from the, the left branch of the tree, the right branch of the tree have to take the same action. If you force that constraint onto the bottom tree, you make them the same. But by constraining yourself to take the same action in two branches of a tree, of course, you can only decrease your expected utility. You can only do worse by being constrained to take the same action in two branches of your tree. If you have the choice, that's always going to allow you to do you better, or at least as good. So that's informally the proof of why the maximum expected utility of, um, why, sorry, this is informally the proof of why the value of perfect information, getting an additional random variable, is, strict, is always bigger than zero, because it allows you to diversify your actions based on the evidence you observe, rather than be constrained to take the same action no matter what evidence comes in. Okay, let's look at some simpler properties of VPI. So this one we already talked about. Um, VPI is always uh, non-negative. And we just justify that with this uh, drawing. And the intuition was, as I just said, if you get to observe that variable before you act, you can adjust your action to the evidence you get to observe. Keep in mind though, for a particular type of evidence, a particular branch of the tree, you might be particularly unlucky and the utility of that branch could be lower than the original utility, but overall it'll average out to be better. They're non-additive. So the value of perfect information of two random variables, EJ and EK, is not the same as the sum 
of their individual values of perfect information. Why is that true? Well, you can think of a simple example. Let's say you have essentially two redundant sensors that effectively measure the same thing. Once you get to use one of those sensors, getting to use the other one in addition is not going to give you any information anymore. And so now the value of perfect information of both of them is the same as the value of perfect information of just one of them. Um, you can write something out for the value of perfect information for two evidence variables. And what you get is this expression over here. The value of perfect information for EJ and EK, given some prior evidence E, is the value of perfect information of EJ given the evidence E, plus the value of perfect information of EK given E and EJ. The second quantity over here is a little tricky. So how do you compute something like that? EJ is a random variable, right? So if you want to compute the value of perfect information of EK given E instantiated and EJ, which is still a random variable, you would compute the value of perfect information of EK given E and every possible value of EJ. So you compute if EJ could take on two values, you compute two values of perfect information. And then you'd average them according to the probability of EJ, uh, according to the probability of EJ given E. The order doesn't matter. Whether you, whether you observe EJ first or EK first is not going to affect the amount of information they give you as a whole. So we can swap that, we can use that to rewrite this with the opposite ordering. This is a lot like the way we could write the product rule in two orderings, X given Y times Y or Y given X times X. Okay, let's do some quick questions here to see if the intuition is clear. The soup of the day is either clam chowder or split pea, but you wouldn't order either one of them. What's the value of knowing which is the soup of the day? Zero, because your expected utility is not affected by that in any way by knowing that. Okay, there are two kinds of plastic forks at the picnic. One kind is slightly sturdier. What's the value of knowing which is the slightly sturdier type? Ten? I like it. <laughs> so you can't really put a number on this unless you put a number on other things too. And let's say you associate a value with um, how much you enjoy your food with a fork that's not broken versus a fork that's broken. Um, and then how likely it is for one type of fork to break versus another type of fork to break. Once you put those numbers down, you might end up with the number 10 as the value of knowing which one is the sturdier one. Key though is, is to understand that if your utility is affected by the quality of the fork, then it's, posit it's a positive value of information to know which one is the sturdier type. You're playing the lottery. The prize will be zero or 100. You can play any number between one and 100. The chance of winning is 1%. So the game is one where you pick a number between one and 100. The outcome is going to be one of those numbers, but you don't know which one ahead of time. Um, if you pick the right number, your utility would be 100. You pick the wrong number, or your prize would be 100. Otherwise, it would be zero. What's the value of knowing the winning number? 99, okay, why 99? Well, we have to compute what is the expected utility without knowing the number. We have an expected utility of one in 100 chance of getting it right, utility of 100 when getting it right, so our expected utility is one if we don't have any evidence. If we do get to observe the number, we can pick that number, our expected utility, maximum expected utility now is 100, and so the difference between 100 and one is 99, and that's our uh, value of information here. How about value of imperfect information? Any thoughts about that? Well, this is a trick question, really. Um, 
There's no such thing. And why is there no such thing as value of imperfect information? Whenever you have imperfect information, let's say you, know, you have an imperfect, imperfect information about where the ghost might be. The way we're modeling that is by using sensors. Our decision diagram, and the part of the decision diagram that matters here is the BaseNet part. Um, the BaseNet will have variables that are noisy observations of the variables we'd like to know. So the way we model imperfect information is by having variables that we do perfectly observe. They just happen to be variables that are noisy versions of the original variables we care about. And so this kind of noisy observation of something now becomes an observation not noisy observation of that particular random variable, namely your, your sensor variable. And so all we need to work with is value of perfect information. All right, we're going to do a couple more questions here. Um, we go back to our original example. This is the oil drilling example. Remember, we had two locations the oil could be at, each with probability 50%. If we, our action was to drill in one of those locations, if we pick the right location, utility K. If we pick the wrong location, utility zero. Now we can get a scouting report, meaning we can send out a scout. That scout will give us a noisy report or a noisy observation of where the oil might be. So it might not tell us exactly where the oil is, but give us some information. Um, the quality of that report might depend on the scout we send out. We might have a good scout and a bad scout, and if we send out a good one, it'll be a higher quality report than if we send out the bad scout. Okay, so what is the value of perfect information of oil location in this new decision diagram? Okay, let's think back to the definition. What do we need to think about? We need to think about what is the ex maximum expected utility when we don't know the oil location, All right? That was K over two, so we had a 50% chance of getting it right. What if we do get to observe the oil location? Um, well, then we have an expect maximum expected utility of K. The difference is K over two. So that's our value of perfect information of oil location. So actually nothing has changed. The base net was complicated, but it only acted as a distractor really. Nothing has fundamentally changed in computing the answer to this first query compared to what we had before. What's the value of perfect information of a scouting report? What I'm interested in here is not a number, even though 10 would be a, a good number maybe. Um, Think about, is this going to be a positive number or zero? Those are the two canonical outcomes. Is it something useful to get or is it not useful to get this counting report? Under reasonable assumptions that this counting report is some noisy version of the oil location. It's going to be positive, right? It gives us information about the oil location which will help us fine tune our action based on the scouting report. We might adjust our actions and hence do better. So this is positive. How about the value of perfect information of knowing which scout is being sent out? Zero, I hear zero. Why zero? So the answer was the reason the value of perfect information of scout is zero is because scout is conditionally independent of oil location given all evidence we have so far. And scout being conditionally independent of oil location given all evidence we've seen so far means that observing that doesn't affect our distribution for the parent variables of the utility node. And if something doesn't affect the distribution for the parent variables of the utility node, it's not going to affect our decision. How about the VPI for scout given scouting report? See some nods for positive, similar reasoning as we had before. But now when we observe the bottom of a V structure, we do have influence that can travel from scout to oil location. So observing the scout random variable will typically, for a generic set of distributions here, affect the distribution for oil location, which is a parent variable of utility, of the utility node. Hence, this will have a positive value of information. 
in general, if the parents of the utility nodes are conditionally dependent of um, some new variable z, given the current evidence, then the value of perfect information of those new variables z will be zero. This is something to keep in mind, because we might give you, on an exam, for example, we might give you a huge base net with many conditional probability tables associated with it. And we might ask you compute the value of perfect information of some variable z, given some evidence. And you could crunch through the numbers and be busy for half of your exam with that one question and find, if you didn't make an arithmetic mistake, that the number is zero. Or you could use your knowledge about deseparation to see if it happens to be the case that these variables are deseparated from the parent variables of the utility nodes. And if that's true, then you right away can answer that without any number crunching. So something to keep in mind. Um, in general, probably, if we ask you something that looks like it require a lot of number crunching in the way you're going to solve it, think again. And maybe there's another way to think about the problem that doesn't require a whole lot of number crunching. OK. So this leads us to POMDPs. What are POMDPs? They're a generalization of MDPs. So what were MDPs? MDPs was an MDP was defined by a set of states, a set of actions, then a transition function that says, what is the probability of landing in state S prime, given I was in state S took action A? And then some rewards function that told you for going from state S with action A into state S prime gives you some numerical value. We had the MDP formalism. We also saw that this is really the same type of formalism as Expectimax. It's an Expectimax decision-making tree. It's just when we looked at MDPs, we saw how to deal with infinite horizon settings, which was hard to do with an Expectimax tree. And we saw how to essentially avoid recomputation. With an MDP, we could avoid recomputing the value of a state if a state appears multiple times in this Expectimax tree. Because we, it's effectively dynamic programming over states. And so you wouldn't recompute things spuriously, as you would do in a naive Expectimax. But so on the right, I'm showing the Expectimax. The intuition of the type of problem we're solving is some action followed by a stochastic transition with rewards associated with it. In POMDPs, we add observations to this. So we now have an observation function, probability of observation given the state. And this is what our Expectimax-like tree looks like now. We take an action. After that, we might get a reward associated with taking that action. Then after that, we get an observation. And we land in a new, but now what we call a belief state. So what we have here for the POMDP is B and B prime. So the reason this is a different letter, not S, is because we don't get to observe the state. All we get to see is an observation. We know how to update our distribution over states. We know how to run Bayesian inference, and we can find the posterior distribution over possible states given the sensory values we observe. And so that's what you do now. In a POMDP, you go from distribution over states, taking an action, getting an observation, to a new distribution over states. So I should have to do uh, quite a bit of computation to go from here down here, because you'd have to compute You'd have to compute the posterior distribution, given your action, given your observation, over possible states. And that's your new belief state, B prime. You can think of this belief state as your new state. You can say, I work in a new state space. My new state space consists of belief states. And I'm doing planning over belief states. I start in a belief state. After I take an action, there is a distribution over the next belief states I could land in. I get a reward associated with what I did. It's stochastic because I don't know where I'm going to land. Then after landing in a new belief state, again, I can choose among actions. Those actions will lead to a new belief state, and that transition can have a reward associated with it, and so forth. The big difference, of course, is now that your state space becomes very, very large, because the number of probability distributions over states is much larger than the number of states. Right? Even if you just had two possible states, the number of probability distributions over those two possible states is infinite. Right? Probability p, let's say, and a real number p between 0 and 1 associated with the first state and 1 minus p associated with the second state, that number p can take on infinitely many values between 0 and 1. So if you want to now, let's say, run value iteration, you would have to run it over infinitely many belief states, even if your original state space was quite small. 
So running value iteration can be quite impractical if you want to run it straight up, because you cannot enumerate all possible belief states. Um, but you can do something like we looked at with MDPs. You can say, I'm going to use an approximate Q function, use a feature-based representation. That's one direction you could go. Another direction you could go, and that's what we're going to look at here, is to go back to the expected max way of computing things. So rather than directly working in the belief state space and trying to run value iteration there, um, we're going to look at a short look ahead. Let's say we look one or two actions ahead, look at the branching of the expected max tree, and effectively we're approximately solving a POMDP, a partially observable market decision process. So the left shows the POMDP-like interpretation. The right, we instead of annotating it with a belief, we write explicitly what the evidence is. You know, you start with some evidence, you take an action, after that there's a chance node which will tell you, uh, then split over possible next evidences, will, will result in a new belief state B prime, which is the posterior distribution over states given evidence E and E prime. So the two trees are really equivalent. One way to think of it is think of it as what is the posterior distribution at each time. The other way to think of it is to think of it as what evidence have I observed so far. The second way can often be a little more convenient because you don't have to keep track of these belief states the same way you do in the first situation. You just keep track of all possible evidence instantiation that could happen as you branch in your process. So we can solve these type of problems, right? What if you, for example, only considered in the Ghostbusters example, you only considered busting or sensing one time followed by a bust? Well, this is what your tree would look like. Busting, many possible busting actions, one for each possible location. Each of them has a utility associated with it, depending on whether you bust it in the right spot or not. And then the other option is to get more evidence. There's many locations you could get evidence, so all possible locations could be chosen from. Um, after that, after you took the sensing action, you get the evidence. could be green, yellow, orange, red. After that, you might take a busting action that is now conditioned on the evidence you observed. You might take an action that relies on what you observed. This is not the entire decision problem. You can, in principle, take another sensing action, which would grow the tree. But we're truncating the tree to make it feasible to compute something in a reasonable amount of time. OK, this is the truncated expected max tree we're going to work with. I'm going to look at the Ghostbusters demo again. And the computer will now think for us and look, compute the root value of this particular tree shown on the slide, decide what is the best action, Maybe it's a busting action in some location. Maybe it's a sensing action in some location. If it busts, then game is over. Hopefully it was in the right spot. If it senses, after it's sensed, we get an observation. And instead of then executing that presumed bust action based on this small tree, we say, well, we only had a limited look ahead. We should replan. After we observe the evidence, let's again build a tree of this type, starting with all the evidence we have so far choose between busting right now versus maybe sensing followed by a bust, and keep doing this. So this is Ghostbusters, where the computer will underneath do all these computations for us, and we'll see how it plays out. So we can just ask for time plus one, and the computer will decide where to sense for us based on the computing the maximum expected utility in the tree we saw on the slide. So let's see what happens here. Um, we sensed in the bottom left there. Um, so far, we got a score of minus one because we sensed once, right? So we in incurred a negative one reward. Okay. Decides to sense up there. Click again. Doing some computation. Senses over there. Okay. Seemingly somewhat unlucky with its measurements so far, but this was more lucky. Now you could wonder, well, what is it going to do? It's less predictable. It'll do that computation in that tree, and we'll see what happens to be optimal under the conditions we're willing to consider here. Um, decided to bust, because the probability was high enough according to that expected utility computation, and it found the ghost and ended up with a utility of 245 here. Can you do better than what we just did? Yes, you can. How can you do better? Um, 
you can do better by not truncating this tree. Right? Just as in your project two, the deeper you could look ahead, the better you could play Pac-Man playing against a ghost. Same thing here. If you can compute fast enough and look further ahead, instead of just bust versus sense followed by bust, maybe you allow for even three times sensing, it'll think about what's a clever sequence of locations to sense, and maybe it'll do something that's significantly better than what we just saw. It'll probably run more slowly, but it depends. If computation time is not an issue, but sensing somewhere is very expensive, you might want to run a deeper search. And then again, after you sense once, you would rerun your search, replan every time. OK, so that's a value of perfect information based agent that you get following this procedure. All right, more generally, and the star here indicates that this is an extension that we're not going to quiz you about, you could generate solutions that map belief functions to actions. So you could divide your belief space. One way to design features is to partition your space. And you could partition your belief space and then have a feature related to in which partition of the belief space you are, and then related to that have either a value function, a queue function, or a policy that might be constant over a certain region of belief space and try to find the best one within that set of features that you're willing to consider. Um, in general, PomDPs are computationally expensive. They belong to a um, set of problems that's P space hard, with a two Ps in the word, um, which are very expensive problems to solve. Um, many real-world problems are PomDPs. Rarely do you actually get to see the full state. And so in practice, you need approximations. And so what we did here, yes, we didn't fully solve the PomDP, but in practice, this is a very reasonable thing to do. Have a limited look ahead, and based on that, take your initial action and replan. All right, that's it for today.